a dialogue with Howard County black owned business owners. So I'm gonna take this opportunity now to introduce each of our panelists. Ms. Fileno Albi and her husband Shola co-founded Sheer Radiance, a natural beauty brand that manufactures hair and body care products using clean and effective ingredients. Their mission is to influence the way women care for themselves and their loved ones by providing products that make them feel beautiful and wonderful. Her business was born out of the need to find a natural solution for her young child's eczema prone skin. That, that need sent her on a quest to her homeland of West Africa where she rediscovered the healing properties of shea butter. An integral part of Shea Radiant's mission is to empower the 16 million African women who are involved in the processing of shea nuts and butter and connect them with women around the world who benefit from the artisan craftsmanship. Fileno believes in the power of economic access and what can happen when women reach out to lift other women. Shea Radiance products can be found in Whole Food Markets, Roots, Mom's Organic Market, Edie's or Roller Park, and Green Valley. Welcome. Welcome. Ms. Lakeisha Claxton <laughs> is founder and president of the Homeland Custodial Services Incorporated an interior and exterior building, cleaning, and maintenance founded and located in Columbia, Maryland. Ms. Claxton created 4C Solution to eliminate cross-contamination. This led to a five-year contract with the, with the Department of Interior National Park Service and became Bloodborne Pathogen Certified. After receiving the certification, Homeland Custodial Services won a contract with the Department of Homeland Security Border Control. Currently, Ms. Prax Ms. Claxon is pursuing a certificate in entrepreneurship at Howard Community College. Thank you, Ms. Claxon. Mr. Brian K. Smith has been serving as an innovator, engineer, community leader, mentor, tutor, and scholar for over 25 years. Founded in 1996, Brian started EduCert, a nonprofit organization dedicated to career development and professional advancement of youth and adults across the country. He serves as the first architect, he serves as the chief architect of all industry-based curriculums within EduCert. He currently trains corporate professionals on developing youth-related initiatives and professional leadership skills and actively creates several after-school, summer, and in industry-based initiatives in STEM, information technology, robotics, culinary, business, finance, filmmaking, and other industries. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Nathaniel, or better known as Nat Alston, offer, often describes himself as a millennial in a baby boomer's body. His background includes po positions jo and jobs in law enforcement, hospitality, healthcare, feud distribution, nonprofits, and financial services. Starting out in entry level positions and finishing his corporate career as a vice president of human resources then beginning his consulting career, and now 17 years later, having been a human capital consultant to over 15 different clients in the area of business, coaching, strategic human resources, and succession planning. The organizations that Nat has had leadership position, which include the National Association of African Americans in Human Resources and UMUC National Alumni Association. He was one of the founders of the National NAARH, and is currently the chair of the National Board of Directors. His public service includes the chair of the Howard County Equal Business Opportunity Commission, and once served as a chair of the Maryland Governor's Commission on Ex-Offender Employment. He has been a past associate member of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement executives and the Association of Campus Law Enforcement Executives when he was a chief of police at Bowie State University. 
In 2008, Mr. Alston founded Ujima Business Roundtable. It's a roundtable of African-American business owners from the counties of Howard, Montgomery, Prince George's, Baltimore, and Baltimore City. The mission of this roundtable is to seek to enrich the lives of African-American business professionals by providing opportunities in education, fellowship, and entrepreneurship. All of our participants this evening are members of the roundtable. Thank you all for participating in this virtual event, and we look forward to hearing your insight and perspective. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Alston. Well, Tanya, thank you very much for that introduction. I sincerely appreciate that. And as you said to the other ones, uh, the check's in the mail, and let's hope you get it very soon. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank also the library, Tanya Atkins, and the library staff, as well as the Columbia Association Archives for putting this on. It is indeed, I speak for the round table, I hope that this is indeed a pleasure for us to be a part of this. And we look at this as a beginning, not an end. We hope to continue this as we go forward under what I call the new normal now. With me, as you, as Leela has introduced the, our panelists tonight, and we're gonna basically keep it open and very informal. We've got some questions that I want them to answer too, but also in the chat room as Nancy is, will be We'll have a Q&A and Nancy is going to send those questions to us and we can answer them as we go forward. So starting off, Leela mentioned all of you have been in business for quite some time. Well, the question is now, and starting off with Phileo with you, you started off in Africa, but what brought you and this business here to Columbia? What made you decide to really launch it maybe and the dreams and goals that you have why Columbia being the starting point? Thanks, Nat. Very great question. And it's nice to meet everyone this evening. You know, my husband and I married and settled in the Howard County area because um, just like Lila had shared before, the Rouse vision made this area very attractive to our family because we've always been people who have appreciated and celebrated diversity. But in terms of our business, when our kids were young, they had just the worst skin on the planet. They were like little alligators between ashy, gray, eczema prone skin. We didn't know what to do. And one of the things the um, pediatrician recommended were cortisones. We didn't feel that was a sustainable option in the long run. And so we started mixing and compounding products in our kitchen. And we reached back to some of the ingredients my grandmother had used on me when I was a kid growing up in Nigeria. And um, I told my mother to bring us some shea butter. We used it religiously on their skin and we saw an amazing difference. And so our business really was born out of our need to solve our personal problems. The market, Target and Walmart, didn't have those solutions back then. This was uh, uh, over 10 years ago. We found that a lot of the moisturizers on the market were really not made. I didn't feel were made for brown and black skin because uh, you know, with my kids, the moment I would put on some Jergens lotion, their skin would literally suck it in and they would be ashy two minutes later. And what we found was that creating products that were rich in natural ingredients like shea, cocoa butter, rice bran oil, and sweet almond oil were the way to go. And really that's how the company was born. Not your mute, so we can't hear you. Yeah, I've got to go mute. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Leo, for giving us that insight on your particular business. Now we go over to Lakeisha. And as I said earlier, Lakeisha, you and I have some uh, parallels. We both are from the Baltimore area. I won't say how long I've been from Baltimore, but uh, you being the younger person of the group here in terms of Baltimorean. Uh, what made you, in terms of your business, I mean, Homeland Custodial Services, 
Uh, did it start out that way or did you decide, well, let me evolve? So your quick story, really, what made you decide to start a business and why that particular business? Well, it, it actually evolved. Um, uh, Columbia has um, lots of um, classes here um, that you can take at the Merlin Center for Entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. And so I had I had a previous previous business and I was dissatisfied with it a lot. And so I, I began to uh, go to the Center for Entrepreneurship, which is, uh, it used to be on 108, it's a gateway now. But um, I began to do that and they gave me all these different concepts. I mean, and these classes were very inexpensive and, you know, I just, I just took as many as I could. Um, there were always some really good sponsors who paid for the classes, uh, the bulk of the class itself. So I took multiple different classes. And so I involved my old business and took all those processes and everything that they, they had given me in, the, in those classes and created Homeland from it. So what now, I mean, if you would describe, we understand what Shade Radiance is all about. What's Homeland Security or Homeland Custodial Services? So what do you do? Oh, okay. So Homeland uh, Custodial Services uh, provides janitorial services uh, and, and custodial uh, encompasses the whole entire facility. So that's, that's what we actually do. Um, we can, um, we also now in this climate, we have become COVID-19 certified so we can provide disinfecting uh, for for businesses, um, and so that's that's kind of where we are now. But uh, it, it's always been about janitorial services, and also I created the Four C solution to eliminate the cross contamination um, that so many uh, so many so many times you find um, people in businesses um, when they're cleaning they're using the same cloths they don't know which is dirty and what's not. So I wanted to differentiate us by doing that. Mm-hmm. So when you started that now, you, you mentioned in today's climate, and I'll get to Brian real quickly, but in today's climate, you were able to make that pivot because you t- shared now that you're COVID-19 compliant. Uh, a lot of businesses aren't able to do that. How were you able to make that pivot to be adaptable now to this present day climate? Well, for one, when we won the contract with Homeland Security, it was all about biohazard cleaning. So for the last three years, we were already doing that type of cleaning. But then with COVID-19, it added a different layer to the viruses we had already, we were already killing there. So what we did was we took some classes that gave us all the information on the way that we needed to do it. And then we implemented the CDC's process uh, for cleaning and then disinfecting. So we had, so we got a certification, my staff, I trained them to put the PPE on. We did all those things. So now that we, we, we are able to do that. So you've got to be, in my opinion, probably one of the few minority uh, businesses that are really certified as COVID-19, particularly maybe in the county, the state, and who knows, maybe in the nation. Well, um, I'm not sure about that, but um, we have been getting uh, a lot of awards. We just got an award in um, Hawaii, which is for the government, OCONUS, which is off the con- continental United States. So that is that is actually for that type of cleaning, the COVID uh, cleaning, which is just, you know, cleaning and disinfecting. Sure, great, great. Thank you, thank you. Mm-hmm. We move on to Brian. Brian, you and a, a really we said earlier a nonprofit, but it's still a business. You know, people right. always say, "Well, okay, I'm in I'm in a nonprofit, but yet you got to make money to stay in business as a nonprofit." So, what really? And my question would be to you: What made you even decide one to go into business, and then the other piece, why a nonprofit? Well, um, I'd say really uh, to start, uh, uh, why did I want to start a business at first? Uh, when I first, um, a long time ago, when I came out of college, I was working at Motorola and I had a mentor there 
Um, uh, it was, he was, I was, I was, me and him were actually the only two African Americans in the whole uh, engineering department there. Um, and it was like a hundred people in our section. And obviously I gradu gradu uh, um, kind of gradually, you know, gravitated to him and had him be as my mentor. He was a contractor, he was an entrepreneur. Um, and he, you know, kind of took me under his wing a little bit, uh, talking to me about starting a business and um, the things I could do as a contractor. And then so I guess he kind of helped me to understand that there's, um, that you know, I could possibly reach my full potential if I took my destiny into my own hands. And so he uh, kind of, you know, encouraged me from there. From there after that, I just got some other technical experience, worked for uh, another company as well too. And then after that started my, my businesses. And so, uh, but I would say really why a nonprofit? I mean, there are so many reasons because because ultimately, I mean, I've always loved serving the community. Um, I love helping people, I love tutoring, mentoring, uh, training, and wanted just to really dedicate, you know, um, my life to doing that. So um, I usually, I would just put a lot of my engineering uh, types of skill sets into what I do with uh, tutoring and mentoring. And so I just kind of wanted to, you know, really not necessarily give back, but just incorporate um, some great, um, you know, strategies that were that were done for me, at least to help and just pass that along constantly and constantly. So I felt like a nonprofit would probably be the best uh, infrastructure and strategy. So um, towards what it is that I, I wanted to do, as opposed to a profit-based model or a profit-based business. Again, going back to, and then Phileo, going back to you in terms of this, we're going to rotate around. Uh, how long have you been in business would be my question for all three. And then also, the length that you've been in business, what are at least possibly one to two, maybe three things that you've learned during the course of your business? If you have to share that with our audience in here now, you've been in business for X number of years, tell us that. And then what are some key nuggets or key points that you've learned by being in business? So I resigned from my full-time IT position in 2009 to really focus my time and energy on building a beauty brand. So that means I've been in business for, let's do the math, 11 years. Okay. Pro probably a little longer because while I worked full time, I was doing the business. I was taking my products out to farmers markets. I was selling um, and we were getting some traction. And then in 2009, I, uh, we realized that this business would either be a side hustle hobby or it was going to be, <laughs> it was going to be a business. And so I took the leap then. And so some things I have learned just from being in business as uh, a, a, a black woman, a, my, uh, an immigrant of an immigrant background over these years, I've learned quite a few things. First of all, it's that entrepreneurship is not a sprint. It's a marathon. Okay. It is not for the faint hearted. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, depending on what industry you're in, I mean, what they call the consumer product good industry, it is very competitive. It is very capital intensive. I started my business to solve a family problem and realized that a lot more people out there were looking for natural, safe hair care and body care products for their families. But in order to play in the field, I had to have um, the kind of resources that a Procter and Gamble and a Unilever would have to be in the stores. And so um, part of what I've learned as a small business is we have to create our own path. And one of the ways we do that is by using social media to reach out to our customers. We can't compete or advertise like the big brands, but I can talk to people face to face. And if they feel the connection, they'll buy the product. The other thing I've learned is the importance of capital. And in Leela's presentation, most of the early business people in Colombia kept reaching out to Mr. Rouse to access bank capital. That is still a challenge for business owners of color today. 
because okay. um, banks, um, investors are not investing in businesses of color. And if I can give some statistics, women of color get less than 1% of all venture capital that is out there. And I think women get maybe about 3%. Everything else is going to someone else. So that accessing funding to grow, to scale your business, to be able to do better, grow faster, is still a challenge we face as, as businesses of color. And I'll stop right there. Okay, all right. Keisha, in your position now, how long have you been in business and are these some of the same challenges you think uh, that you faced or were they new or additional challenges that you faced starting your business? Well, um, I've been in this business for five years uh, this year, and I feel like I feel the same. Like uh, the the capital is a is a huge issue. I mean, even when you're getting awards uh, and you're at a at a bank, they're they're telling you they can only give you a certain percentage of your revenue. And so, if you if you win a new award. And you have you have payroll, you have other uh, expenses like materials and things like that. That that what you previously made is not going to cover. You know, it it doesn't it doesn't add up at the end of the day. What you previously made the year before, and you just got a new award. You can't put you. That's not going to help you with it. What they're offering you because, I mean, you get a big award. And they're saying 10% of your last year's revenues, that's not going to allow you to make payroll every month. And so I totally agree with Phileo. This is, this is um, not for the faint of heart. It's not. I mean, in, in growing and scaling your business, I mean, you really, uh, capital is just, it's hard. It is. And I've taken, I've taken many classes on that and, I mean, even another thing I've learned about is bonding. Um, the state of Maryland, uh, if you want a contract over $100,000, well, you have to be bonded. Um, and so I had a hard time being bonded, hard time. A large contract and I got turned down by uh, a woman who spoke in front of Congress about bonding for, for, for people, and I mean, her, she, she, she was up in front of Congress telling them how hard it is for small business to be bonded. And literally her business could not get me bonded. So I, 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 feel, I feel like capital in, in, in my business bonding, especially for state contracts, um, it's, it's limiting you know, your ability to scale and grow. Okay. Brian, you wanna add also to that? Well, yes. I mean, I, I definitely have experienced uh, the same things um, um, also before. I've been in business for 24 years. And um, from what I've seen there, it's, it's, it's always a challenge um, to get funding. Funding is always the, probably the number one challenge that we have. And, it's been some, and it's really for, for various reasons. Um, in the space of a nonprofit, there is a challenge where there's a lot of other nonprofits usually trying to go after the same funding that you're going after. So at times you have to, you're, you're still in a competition. Um, at times you have to always prove that you've done something before just to ensure that you can get that funding is more than just that you have a good idea. You have to make sure to develop past performances. Um, so that's something that I've learned um, in my business. And um, fortunately we had to, you know, we, I've learned that's how we kind of started out just really just providing people with um, evidence, proof. And we just kind of had to rework some of the ideas of funding um, to say, well, what were, we, what were we gonna use that funding for? And so when it came to supplies and so forth, that I figured let's just you know, ask certain people to give us those supplies and then let's um, focus on just doing some work. You know, If we spent money on marketing, um, then let's just focus on spending our, our energy in doing the work and then use that as the marketing. And that's kind of how we were able to grow our business um, over time and then um, you know, get it out there. But we still had, we, even to today, we still have problems with funding, uh, applying for things. And oh my goodness, Keisha, you're so right. <laughs> when it comes to those loans and the, the, the loans aren't really enough at times. 
um, to really propel you and grow you. Um, we have gone after different types of funding and have not um, received them. Other challenges we've had, we actually, actually, we received um, an investor for a big project um, like a $1.25 million uh, investment, underwriter, underwrote everything and fine. But uh, typically the challenges we ran into was, um, you know, once they really start to know who they're dealing with, then all of a sudden paperwork isn't signed, it's not as changed. And what I run into, my name is Brian Smith. So when people, and we're looking at my resume, the only way you look at my resume and know that I'm, I'm African American is the fact that I used to be a part of the National Society of Black Engineers. Outside of that, you wouldn't tell who I am and out of all the information I give, but once we're on video or we're talking to people, then all of a sudden things change. And that, um, um, that has always been a challenge. That's one of, the, one of the major hurdles as to, is this business really viable? Is this really going to work? And, um, and I think that speaks to the reality of African-American, the challenges a lot of African-American business at times have, because even everyone else still understands it. They understand is this business really going to survive? Because I know they have challenges. I know they will. So I'm not sure whether they're going to give them the funding because I know that they, will all, they probably will have some challenges. And that, that kind of speaks to that, which is very interesting. So um, it's kind of well known if, um, that, that there's some challenges we have to get over. But I think that um, you know, it, it does take perseverance. It takes, uh, it's not for the faint of heart. Oh my goodness, yes. So right, um, uh, from Leo just said that, said that earlier. So I would say, um, you know, I've learned a lot that you have to be, uh, unfortunately, in a way, you got to almost be perfect because some people won't give you a second chance if you mess up the first time for some reason. Um, and then they just kind of discount you. So we've got to be on point. We've got to be strong um, and, you know, always be as high quality as you can. Yeah, you, you gave me, when you were saying that, I had some flashbacks as uh, Leela was introducing me and giving background. I used to work for I always used to joke, I work for a, a small mom and pop company in Bethesda called Marriott Corporation. And I <laughs> used the phrase mom and pop because when I was there, the Marriott's were there as founders. And mm -hmm. as a consultant, I always, Marriott used to say, and I use it now, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. And so having, uh, as just a side note, my business is now going into December will be 20 years for me being in business. And understanding that, I think what happened with me, if I may add to the uh, panel there, uh, coming out of corporate America, I had, I think, a little bit different perspective and an advantage, I guess you can say. Uh, understood how the corporation played, and I also knew how the game was played. And one of the things that I've shared with you guys being part of the business roundtable is that one of the things when I coach um, members, I always ask the question, who's your banker? And you've heard me say that with all of you in there. And most of the time, the answer that I would get was a particular branch, whether it was M&T, BB&T, or whatever, not saying that those were companies out there. And I said, I didn't ask you where you bank. What, who is your banker? Because most of the time in our businesses as people of color, we don't have that banking relationship with a person. And that's one of the things that we were sharing, again, that access to capital, that access to capital also comes with that banking business relationships. And the difficulty is that when I see how businesses start, they're starting from, as you said, Phileo, from the bottom up and really not having that sophistication or understanding of where to go to and who to go to and developing those relationships. So those are one of the challenges, as you said, and I do agree, it's access to capital, absolutely. And I knew that going in. And fortunately for me, when I left, I left a financial institution and I knew some people already there. So it was easy for me because they knew who I was. And I knew the systems in there in terms of underwriting and that type of thing in terms of the loans in there. So again, for our listeners out there, we grant, we understand that access is to capital is one of the main challenges that's out there as a black business owner. But now let's move on because I don't want, I'm cognizant of time because we really got, want to leave it open for um, people who are participating, the participants here to ask some questions. But if you're really now looking at it from today, this is August, we've got COVID-19. We know it's not going to go away. We're operating under the new normal. 
What do you see now in your respective businesses as now the climate that you face? What do you see now? What's out there? I don't want to say growth or non-growth, but as a business owner now, a CEO of your own company, what do you see now out there in terms of your own environment? We'll start with Keisha this time. Well, um, what I see in in the um, the janitorial and custodial em environment that I, my space um, is that it's really really important. Um, it always was important, but I feel like it's really really important. So um, the CDC has these new recommendations. Um, as we're looking at um, at this contract for the FAA, and so they had they have new recommendations for those type of facilities, and they are twenty four seven. So now they want someone in there cleaning the the high touch areas twenty four seven. So the 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 whole the whole landscape of that is changing because before it was like okay well maybe you'll come one day here one day there you know it 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 could always be five days a week just depending on the volume of a place but um, as you have as you have uh, facilities like that you know you got people in there all day moving about and going and so now the CDC is recommending that you have three eight hour shifts mm -hmm. to do um, to do cleaning and disinfecting of all high touch points. And that is outside of the regular of the regular janitorial services. That doesn't even include both. So mm -hmm. I feel like for for this space, there's going to be a lot of opportunity in it. Great, great. That's good to hear. Aleo, what about you? Um, so uh, if I may say something about the climate, I want to talk about the intersection of the COVID-19 and um, the murder of George Floyd and the impact it is having in society as a whole and how that ultimately is forcing everyone, both black and white, to think about how uneven the playing field has been all along. You know, I, I'm just, I was really struck by Leela's presentation because it, even though a lot of the things that were put in place by Jim Rouse, he was, I feel like he was very proactive, a man ahead of his time. Yeah. And I still feel that in 2020, those accommodations and that vision he had still needs to be implemented. I don't think that those things have been in place. And I think that after George Floyd's murder, before the whole nation, people have begun to rethink um, business as usual. And one of the things that I kind of wanted to throw in there about just the intentionality about leveling the playing field, um, entrepreneurs of color are just as hardworking, we have to be more resilient and more hardworking than many of our peers because like Brian said, we don't often get a second chance. We also have to be super creative because we don't have the resources, but we also need Howard County to be intentional about making sure that doors stay open. And I'll give you an example. In Howard County, when Ellicott, um, historic Ellicott City had those two floods, mm -hmm. we as a county, as a, a, a community um, surrounded, supported them, not just um, emotionally, but financially, the county invested in rebuilding Ellicott City back twice. Now, I don't know how many businesses of color have a storefront on his historic Ellicott City, but people got a lot of help. I think that the county needs to be that intentional about investing and supporting businesses of color in this county because a rising tide raises all ships mm -hmm. and if we prosper the entire county prospers agreed agreed brian 
Well, um, I would say, I mean, I think that we're right. I mean, as far as the climate um, is concerned for our business, I mean, we are in the education business. And so we do a lot of our activities in schools, after school, dealing with parents and um, doing a lot of training and so forth, as well as with companies. So we, as everybody can probably see on the news, there's, there's, there's just been a halt in a lot of decisions and up just question marks as to what happens with our educational um, system and, and how that impacts learning and youth. So, I mean, it um, has really impacted us in a sense because um, after since March, we weren't able to get access to a lot of our students, um, at least in person, mm -hmm. obviously. But um, we had to pivot. We had to pivot a little bit. We had to do things online and so forth. And now we're living in a world where at least for the next first half of the year, at least, um, we already know we're not going to be able to see physically our students in in person. And then we even and we've checked up on them. We talk with our parents. Many of them are still struggling with uh, just assisting their children. And then their children are having um, this connection and social issues with not seeing their friends and so forth. So there's a, there's a, there's some additional you know concerns that are added into our regular challenges mm -hmm. um, of of providing services. So I mean that's kind of the climate that we're in. But the good thing is um, there's good news with it. The good news I would say is that we have understood, and I think many other people too, that when there's a big need like this, there's a great opportunity to come up with something creative, to be um, inventive, and to to literally serve even more people than you would normally would. So it's a uh, and that's kind of the ideal scenario of, uh, of an entrepreneur where you do really want people to want services in general. And if you can come up with something creative that matches what you do or it matches what they need, then, you know, then you're, you're just about almost, you know, back in business or even stronger and better. So it really pulls out on the creativity. So I think that this is, um, this is, it's, even though it's a hard time, it really challenges us to see how much do we really, uh, how, how skillful are we really? Um, that that's this is the time to kind of see that, and I think, um, and we're trying to pull that out, and many other companies are trying to do the same thing too in our climate. Yeah, and I, I tend to agree with you all in that. I think one, when we start looking at our businesses in here, as, and I've shared that with you on our business roundtable, we really have to start focusing and looking at this environment from that, as I use the term, thirty thousand feet up. We know that you can produce that product or provide that service there but now this is basically a change to start thinking now as that ceo potentially at thirty thousand feet up and it's a segue that going back uh, if i can now i'm looking at some of the questions in the chat room and one of the questions that was brought up when we talked about access to capital uh was do we recommend relationships and i mentioned that earlier with small local or minority-owned banks rather than the large national banks. And my personal opinion is that from, coming from a financial institution, and you know, I've recommended it to you guys, the big three that's out there, and we all know what those big three and the big four, for minority-owned uh, companies, those big threes really are not really what I would recommend we go after because you're basically dealing with the branch and not really the person at that particular uh, regional office, if you will, to really build that relationship too. So back to the question, do I recommend small or local banks or minority owned banks rather than the larger one? Yes, I recommend the smaller bank because it then gives you that intimate relationship. You don't have to go all the way up that flagpole, so to speak. And if I mention, you know, no disrespect to the Bank of America's, this SunTrust and others, they're huge. But we've got some minority-owned banks here, Industrial Bank in Washington, D.C., Harbor Bank in Baltimore. And it gives you a chance to possibly, and even Howard Bank here, it gives you that chance of having an intimate relationship. As we talk about relationship banking, that's the key point. Branch managers, I would say to our audience and to you guys, you, you've heard me preach this before, branch managers come and go. So you may have a relationship with that branch manager, but he or she may be gone in the next week or the next year or whatever. But you want to at least go to that corporate office and develop that relationship with a regional and all. A smaller bank, even though it may, and, and today's world now, smaller does not mean small and everything else. I mean, the technology now, these small banks can do everything the bigger banks can do. 
in terms of uh, check cashing that eight and what I call an ATM mentality. But when you're looking at lines of credit, and this is what we're talking about, those lines of credit out there for those, it's those smaller banks possibly, or those mid-sized banks that can give you that intimate relationship because they, they now know the community. They live in the community. They understand what we're doing. So that would be my recommendation. I throw it back out there to you guys. Uh, say, Keisha, would you agree or disagree or what has been your experience in working maybe with the small banks or maybe the, what I would call the medium size, not the big, big three, but the medium size ones? Um, well, I just want to say I agree with Vallejo before I get into that. I, I totally agree that um, the county needs to really support um, uh, us more. Um, being a person who, um, in ha of me, um, you know, just being a black woman, um, and also I have the, the county certification, um, uh, brother Nat, that you're on the, the EVO. Um, you know, I feel like there need to be more opportunities there because I have a lot of friends who have business in the county and, and none of them, uh, they are all black and they, they don't have contracts with the county okay. and I don't have any either. So I just wanted to agree with her on that. Okay. But, um, I'll say, um, as far as, um, the, the banking, um, yeah, I I didn't get any help with my my bank. Um, I really didn't. I was I was told that line, you know, it's just a percentage and, and those type of things. And being in uh, Ujima, um, I working with MNT uh, has been a better experience for me. Um, uh, you know, they have a division for minority business um, women. So I, I think that that's helped me more and I was able to meet with my banker mm -hmm. uh, on a regular basis versus when I went to my bank, my branch, as we call it. <laughs> I went to my branch. It was like, oh, well, I got to put you over to, uh, you know, this person over somewhere else who, who has no idea who I am, which I've known the branch manager there for five years. So mm -hmm. um, I feel like uh, having that relationship, um, as you said so many times at our meetings, is really, really important. But I think that uh, for me, M&T um, uh, offers that. Yeah, I yeah. feel like they offer that. Yeah. Well, both of you mentioned, too, the county. And, and, and we focus on that, too, uh, in terms of doing more. Do... I'm, and I'm thinking out loud when I, say, when I hear you saying the county because... Most all of you were have been registered by our EBOC, the County Department of Purchasing, as far as the EBOC, Equal Business Opportunity. What do you feel that the county now, the county government, in terms of supporting black businesses? Because here's what we're looking at from a standpoint of doing a study to see what the county, how has the county benefited black businesses? We're looking at possibly a, a study out there. So I'm going to flip it back to you. What, if you gave me some ideas, what should the county be doing to support black businesses from your perspective? And I'll start with Paleo, since you brought it up first, you know, I'm going to turn to you and say, give me some questions, some points. What do you expect as a black woman business owner based on what you saw, said, listening to Leo, talk about James Ross. What can the county government do? So, um, I'll be very honest. Yes. Um, now, before I started, you know, working with you and became part of the Ujama Roundtable, I was actually looking to move my business into the city because Baltimore City is very realistic about the demographic that they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, they have resources available for businesses that might not exactly fit banking guidelines. Um, I knew that if I moved my business to the city, I would have access to maybe 100,000 more in low interest loans. And so that became very attractive to me. 
um, after talking to a couple of people and especially Nat and being that I am a resident of Howard County, I pay my taxes here. Um, I was talked into <laughs> remaining in the county. And so um, there's been a bit of a cost um, wanting to be close to home, wanting to keep my business in my community. And so what I would like to see is Howard County being honest about the disparities that exist mm -hmm. for minority, especially black owned businesses. And I'll be very specific to black owned because sometimes when we say people of color, there are people of color who don't necessarily have the same challenges as black people. Let's be, let's just be really honest. You know, <laughs> being black is a very loaded situation in the United States. And I think that with that in mind, the same kind of intentionality that Jim Rouse had, who is mm -hmm. almost like the father of Colombia and surrounding um, communities, um, is the kind of intentionality I would like to see Howard County Economic Development um, do for um, um, our businesses. The same way we were able to get the moral backbone and the, the will to rebuild historic Ellicott City and restore all those businesses, all those millions um, to get that city back into beautiful shape. I'm very proud of it. It's seven minutes from my home. I would like to see that level of excitement, intentionality and passion um, directed to um, black owned businesses in this county. Because when we win, everyone wins. If you take care of the weakest in your midst, um, the whole chain is stronger. So it's always gonna be a win-win and we're not looking for handouts. We already work as hard or even harder than most people. We just want equal access. Gotcha, okay. Brian, any, um, wanna to add to that? Well, I, I definitely agree. And I, I would say too, um, specifically, I think what works and what, what's really needed is a very strong uh, business development mentoring process such that when a business wants to start, that you can pair them up with another successful business and such that it's kind of a program that's designed to ensure to get you at least to a certain level, um, you know, to ensure that you're gonna grow. Um, that kind of model, it's, it's not an old model, uh, obviously, but I think it's something that if it's really championed, um, you know, by the county and then by companies to say, you know, we're gonna take one 100 businesses this year in these industries and we wanna support them and you know, I think that really helps. Um, I think a long time ago in 2006 or five, we did some business, um, I know, with um, the school system and certain schools. And, um, in, and we actually, there was, back then, there were these networking kind of activities where all these businesses were there and then we did get some business from it and it worked out nice. Uh, we hadn't seen those in a long time, but I think that if that, pick back up again if those things were uh, a little bit more uh, known to more businesses and more organized then i think that we could have a better system of support um for everybody else so we wouldn't be struggling as much but i think that's possibly what's what we needed um that from, from my perspective okay great we've got another question that was in the chat room too and i'll open it up for everyone and i'll add opinion too do you think Columbia remains open and supportive to minority businesses continuing Rouse's vision and commitment. Again, I'll repeat that. We've listened to what Leo talked about, what James Rouse did for as his company. We also listened to what he did in terms of supporting black owned businesses in Columbia, the, particularly the village centers. This uh, person is asking, do you think Columbia still remains open and supportive to minority businesses and it's, and it's continuing of Rouse's vision and commitment? Anybody want to chime in? I won't go around there, but just unmute. And if I see that, then I'll pick up on you. Anyone? Well, well, I'll, I'll start by saying one thing. I think that like something you said that is, is very key. I think it's by relationship because um, for us, we have been dealing with certain specific people um, that has helped us and, um, and, and it's, you know, because some, some of us are dealing with uh, nonprofit or government, I mean, nonprofit or 
some companies and other non other organizations. Then there's another side of government. So I think it it kind of depends a little bit. But um, I would think that from my experience, I would think that in some pockets that yeah, some people are continuing that. I just think there's there, there's not enough of us out there that are continuing that 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 field though. Okay, good. Anyone else? Will I chime in? <laughs> Well, let me say this to the person that made the, uh, put the question in there. Does Columbia remains open and supportive to minority businesses continue with Ralph's vision and commitment? When you say Columbia, I'm thinking about now who really is the main driving force in the town of Columbia, and that's the Howard Hughes Corporation. And to answer that question back to uh, the person who posed that, my assessment after being in here in business for 20 years and being in the EPOC and really living here in Columbia and understanding the business climate as it relates to minority businesses, I'm going to answer that and say, no, I don't think it's open. And here's why I'm saying that. Rouse, as I mentioned to several people on an email, was truly one in a million. Uh, he, and I had the pleasure, and I shared this with Leela, I had the pleasure many years ago of meeting James Rouse. And for many of you that probably are just in Columbia for less than maybe 15, 20 years, I can go back in terms of history and I'll get to the question too. James Rouse lived in Wild Lake. He lived here. He and his wife, Patty, lived here. They lived off of Green Mountain Circle. If you're familiar with Wild Lake High School, he could walk to Wild Lake High School. And I remember seeing him there. His children went, his grandchildren went to Wild Lake. I shared the story. His granddaughter, Molly Norton, went to school with my daughter. So it was not an idea back to your comment, Flail. Yeah, he didn't just talk, he walked the walk. So when he passed on and the Rouse Company, as you now know, Rouse Company, for some of you, that's where Whole Foods is now. That was the Rouse Company. And that was, the, uh, then it was bought out, if my memory serves me right, and Nancy and uh, particularly Leela, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that was bought out by General Growth. And then General Growth was acquired by Howard Hughes. So, and the Howard Hughes Corporation, when I say supported to minority businesses, and let's say black owned businesses, I'm gonna give them, and I said it in the email, it's a flat out no, it's dismal. Uh, sitting on the EPOC, we've asked for diversity and inclusion to hire and promote black businesses, similar to what you was the questionnaire saying, Rouse's vision, Howard Hughes does not have Rouse's vision. Howard Hughes has the vision of Dallas, that's where their corporate headquarters lies, and then also to their shareholders. So Rouse, nobody really, back to the question that was posed, does it remain open? It may be open, but nobody's walking into that door wanting to continue Rouse's vision and commitment. I don't see it. I don't feel it. And the fact of the matter is when Rouse, and going back to Leela's comment, when he helped people open up the raw bar in the mall, right now, folks, there's no black restaurant in Howard County. None. So when you say that question again, has Columbia remained open and supportive? Uh, it's open, but when I start looking at open and support from the primary driver of that Columbia vision being Howard Hughes Corporation, and I'm pointing them out and hey, it is what it is. It has not been a continuation of Rouse's vision and dream. And I respected James Rouse, what he did, Keisha coming out of Baltimore, he put Montgomery Mall on the west side of Baltimore. So far as I'm concerned for anyone in here, James Rouse to me is absolutely a person who inspired black businesses and who walked the walk and talked the walk. And that's what's missing right now. So I hope I've answered that question for the uh, panelists on the uh, questionnaire, but uh, we hope to change that. Let's hope that this, panel discussion, this meeting tonight starts to get them to move in the right direction. Comments, uh, anyone? You know, uh, Nat, 
Yes. This is Greg Fitchett. I'm the president of Howard Hughes in Columbia. Good. Glad you're on, Greg. Yes. Thank you. And thank you to the library system and the Columbia Art Archives for hosting this. Um, I would turn my video on, but I'm actually on vacation right now. That's okay. I'm glad you got my, I'm glad you got my email and I'm also glad that you're on. And Nat, you know, I, I just like to say, I mean, I, I know your position. You've been very involved in our diversity and inclusion efforts for the last four years. Mm -hmm. um, and you're aware that we have met and exceeded all of our targets that we committed to four years ago. And uh, so, you know, it, it's disappointing that you feel that we are not uh, maintaining the vision of Jim Rouse. We certainly believe that we are. And I'm happy to meet anyone on this call uh, to talk about our minority participation efforts and specifically our black-owned business participation efforts. We have many black-owned businesses that we have started to work with and engage with and have done million dollars of contracts with uh, over the past four years specifically since we began the commitment uh, that we entered into with, with uh, Howard to develop downtown Columbia. So um, I obviously have a different viewpoint than what Nat just shared. Uh, for those of you who are on the email chain, I respond to that in more detail. But again, I would be very happy to meet with anyone. Uh, we are big believers in downtown Columbia being an inclusive project. We are big believers in continuing the vision of Jim Rouse. I personally am very committed to it. I live here in Howard County. I'm raising my children in Howard County. They go to Howard County Public Schools. So, uh, you know, again, Nat, I'm, I'm sorry that you have this uh, viewpoint that we're not committed to minority owned businesses and to black owned businesses specifically. I believe we do, and I'm happy to talk to anyone, uh, you know, separately about this uh, to, to show what our commitment is. I appreciate that, Greg, really. I do appreciate that. And if you understand what I said, hey, it was one of these points. Uh, I, that's what I want. I want dialogue. I want dialogue and commitment in here. Uh, Can I say something, this is, please? This is my viewpoint, but I want to open it up, Paleo. Please go right ahead. So one of the things that I have found just being in business for a while and working with different organizations and really having people have honest conversations is there's a litmus test that I find is so simple, especially when organizations say that they are working with minority businesses. Because sometimes, unless you're measuring the right things, you might not be aware that you're missing some things. And really, this might go to, a little bit to Greg's point. So a lot of companies have quotas for minorities. But my test is get a Polaroid of all the contractors you're working with as an organization. If you're a bank, get a Polaroid of all the people you're lending to. If you're an investor, get a Polaroid of all the people you're investing in and look at their faces and tell me how many of them are black faces. Because on paper, you might be hitting that 30%, but that 30% might have very few black people. So minority includes many things. So I'm, I like to take things down to the nitty gritty. Put pictures to the folder and tell me how many of these businesses are black. Then if that number is much less than you imagined it was because you're meeting the 30% or 10%, then we can work at it and we can be more intentional because when people of color and black people complain that they're not being seen and heard, we're not crazy. There's a reason we've been rejected so many times. We know this thing happens, but sometimes, you know, other people might not see it. So the Polaroid test is my test. I always challenge companies, you know, put a picture to that application form. How many of the people you ended up selected look like you and how many of them look like someone like me? Good point. Um, Good point. I wanted to, um, I, I had to just really agree with that, what Phileo said, because um, when you, when you talk about minority, you can meet that, you can meet that goal, but I mean, how many people are black? And so my suggestion for the county was actually, and and now, um, Greg, that you're on, my suggestion was that there was some of that set aside to be for specifically for Black people. Because um, when you have contracts uh, for the state of Maryland that are in Baltimore, when you have the MBE program, Howard County has the, um, the EBO program, but the MBE program, it'll say, okay, minority. 
but then it will say, okay, a percentage of this, even in that, in that if it's 30%, a percentage of that, 10% of that is for black people. Because, I mean, I feel like you are just absolutely right. That can be met without including myself. It, it really can. And so I just feel like I personally want to do business in this county, but I don't do any business in this county. My business is here because I live here, but I have no business in Howard County. And I was able to do a little something on this on, on the side, but nothing major that that I have done. I can't really talk about what I did, but it's nothing major that I have located in the county that I would like to hire people in. I'm 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 all over the place and not even in the county where I live at. So, um, so uh, I just totally agree with that. If, if I could uh, just respond to a couple of things that, that uh, Keisha said. Um, first of all, I, I completely agree. We're supportive of the idea of being able to get more specific. Our targets are just for minority owned, women owned, they're not specific to particular racial or ethnic groups. Uh, that's the agreement that we have with the county. In order for the county to advance that sort of uh, more granular focus that could include specific targets for black owned businesses. What needs to happen is the county needs to undertake what's, what's called a disparity study. And that's the only way legally that the county can tar put specific targets for specific minority groups. Um, so uh, so that's, that's, and I know that's been discussed with the county. Um, in fact, uh, Jennifer Jones, who kind of heads up the county executives efforts for uh, economic development. Um, we were in discussions with this uh, a few months ago before COVID hit. Uh, so I think that's you know, a lot of things have been put on pause, obviously, with the pandemic. But um, that, that discussion has been, uh, you know, underway with the county. The other thing I want to say, I don't have a comprehensive list, but a lot of the businesses that are, that, you know, are meeting our, our minority participation goals are black owned. For, for example, uh, Kane Contracting, uh, Genesis Steel, uh, MPS Security, Best Fence, uh, PD engineering. These are all black owned businesses that we work with. And really these are uh, relationships, contracting relationships we've, we've developed through our outreach efforts we've undertaken over the last four to five years. So uh, while it's not a specific you know, percentage of the 30%, uh, we are engaging and specifically trying to do outreach for black owned businesses because we do recognize the situation of black people in America is not the same as every other minority group. Other, other minority groups face challenges, of course, but, you know, Black Americans have a very different history. It goes back to the start of the country. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, others in here. We're looking at some other questions in here. Um, question is, whether being a woman-owned business helps you competing for contracts. So, again, repeating that. Whether being a woman-owned business helps you competing for contracts. Keisha, can you answer that one? Um, well. Do you think that's an advantage being a, uh, a woman owned business? Does that help you in terms of competing for contracts? I, I don't really think it, I don't really think that it has um, because uh, there's a very small percentage of federal contracts that um, goes to women um, so uh, to me, it was easier to me for me to win uh, small business contracts. Mm -hmm. um, the woman-owned program is, I mean, a lot of a lot of agencies don't meet their goal in that. Um, so I find that you know I'm always bidding really on um, small total small for the federal government total small business contracts because mm -hmm. the women-owned just does not just they don't meet their goals. And so okay. they're not, so the contracts aren't out there. So I don't feel like that helped me. Gotcha. We're going to have a few more minutes. Uh, one, I wanted to just recognize uh, what was brought up to by uh, Greg and the disparity study. I will tell you all that's on the call on this meeting tonight that we at the EBOC is definitely moving forward on that uh, proposal to get a disparity study here as far as the county government. Uh, in terms of contracts being awarded, particularly to businesses here in Howard County. And I think I've shared it with our business roundtable people too, uh, in the Ujima Business Roundtable, 
that the county government is just one leg of a purchasing uh, vehicle here in the county. You also have the school system, which is a separate entity in itself. And then also you do have the Columbia Association, which is right here. And also you have the library. So one of the things that too, I'm thinking that's coming out from this meeting too, that there will be a dialogue or a reaching out by the two people that are sponsoring this, the library and Tanya, and also the Columbia Association. Uh, we've had those types of uh, meetings before with the Small Business Roundtable. So really just exposing not just the county, but the other, uh, shall I say, other entities that do have purchasing requirements in here. Those three that we listed or that I just mentioned. The other piece too is also the business climate itself uh, here. Back to that person's question. Is there a climate back here in Columbia that will, back to your point, Phileo, will create a, shall we say, a culture where this can be an invitation for, to do black business? You mentioned Baltimore, sure, the demographics, but is there a culture or a climate here in Columbia as, or in Howard County that's conducive? And that's what we're thinking we're trying to really bring forth is that this is an area, as, I, as you said, to keep you here, making sure that the climate is going to be supportive here. That's what we're looking at too. Uh, any other, let me see, uh, is there any other questions in the chat room? I'm looking at time. Yeah, we're at 741. Here's what we're gonna do now. I'm gonna basically leave it up to the three of you to do a wrap up and really say, uh, leave it open, whatever closing comments you want to make um, in regards to this. This is the first time it was been, has been done on this format. We hope that the library and the Columbia Archives uh, will continue something like this. We love the dialogue. It was stimulating and definitely uh, challenging. I have no problems with that. So leaving back, starting up alphabetical order, Vallejo, closing remarks. Any closing remarks, comments that you want to make? Um, I'm really grateful to have had the opportunity to be on this panel. I'm a proud Howard County resident. Uh, like I said, we moved here 20 years ago to live in this county because um, of the Rouse vision um, to create a, a, a community where your neighbors, uh, and, and the people you interacted with, with were just diverse and just to be able to enjoy the richness of what diversity brings. Um, I believe the potential and the vision Jim Rouse had can be realized and revitalized again. And just as it impacts all businesses, it'll make our community stronger. It will make our schools a friendlier. <laughs> more diverse place where there's equity in education. So my closing comments are just really going back to Leela's presentation. Hearing that presentation just kind of renewed my, my faith in what Howard County can be if we're very intentional about really um, bringing Jim's vision to life again. I think this is the time we can do it again. And I'm grateful that Greg was on this call. I really appreciated what he said um, in acknowledgement of the difference in the Black experience in America. I wasn't born in this country. I was born in the UK, raised in Nigeria, but I live in this country as a Black person and I also carry that weight of all it means to be Black in America. And I, I want to thank Greg for recognizing that because I think it's really important. Thank you. Thank you. Keisha, closing remarks. Um, I just want to say that I think that this um, panel has been really wonderful. I really, um, like Phileo, I really enjoyed the, the stories of, of the Black business owners. And, and, um, and so um, I just feel like I really want to be able to um, do business here um, in Howard County. I feel like that that is one of the goals um, that I have for our company because we are here and that is why I wanted to move here with my girls because it is such a diverse place um, and that 
you know, um, it's just, it has so many good things going on. I feel like, I feel like where the, where that kind of comes in is in the business is, is the business area of it. But I mean, other than that, it's, it's a really, really good place to live. Columbia is a good place to live and it's been really good to me and my family. Um, I've been able to, um, make a lot of friends here. I've been able to, even with you, brother Nat, you know, join a church here together. I mean, you know, we're in the same church. And so, um, so I'm really glad tonight. And I would, I would definitely like, um, to talk with, um, Greg about, um, about the issues that I have with, um, the, what me, me, um, as the owner, CEO of, of Homeland trying to reach out to Howard Hughes. Um, and also I do want to thank him for recognizing that um, being black is, is different. It's different from, it's a different experience um, being a, in that, that set of minority in this country. So I just really appreciate everybody being here tonight and just really enjoyed it. Thank you. Brian. Yes, um, I was going to say similarly too. I, I really appreciate um, this opportunity, and and thank you for inviting me to be on a part of this panel and just the the, the uh, discussion. Um, I I'd say closing remarks really will be is that I think during this time um, of the coronavirus and COVID nineteen um, and all of us social distancing, um, it's more important than ever that we. Um, that we really come together, I mean, and continually and forcefully uh, and passionately continue to continue this discussion and keep talking. Because um, even though we're supposed to be social distancing, we can't distance ourselves away from all of these concerns and is issues that are there. And so we have to work with strategy. We have to really work together to, to uh, support each other with solutions, um, not be selfish with solutions and ideas, um, but to hopefully, you know, work together to do, you know, three main things, you know, as business owners, um, supporting each other to become believers in our business. Uh, once we can get people to believe in us, um, hopefully to support us, then we can get them to become supporters, which means they actually support and help our businesses grow. And then I think the last part is really working on advocacy, getting people to advocate for our business. Because if we can build those advocates in other companies, then those people kind of work for us too and that they're on their own advocating for our concerns and ensuring that we can make some pathways. And that, I think that we need more believers, more supporters, but definitely more advocates for our concerns so we can um, you know, continually grow this uh, to, to yield that vision that we're trying to make. Great. Well, I want to thank all three of you for participating tonight and really starting off, hopefully, as we said earlier, this is only the beginning. I hope it continues. And I wanted to see it continue. I want to send again a special thanks to the Howard County Library mm -hmm. and the Columbia Association Archives, particularly uh, Leela representing the Columbia Archives. And Nancy, thank you so much for the uh, helping out as far as the technical aspects of it. And I'm going to close, leave it now to Miss Leela Williams to uh, close us out. Leela, thank you so much again on behalf of Brian, Vallejo, and Keisha, and myself. Thank you so much, Mr. Nat. Um, this has been an amazing uh, evening, really appreciative of the opportunity to have this, this dialogue. Um, one thing I failed to mention at the onset is in the title of this particular uh, title of this event, it started out with Let's Talk, which is actually a continuation of a program that the Columbia Archives, um, as well as the library system and at least seven more um, collaborators. We all came together last year on uh, June 19th of 2019 as the only sanctioned um, collaboration under the 400 year commission to sponsor the Let's Talk International Day of Drumming and Healing. And so that Let's Talk portion that comes right before Newtown is just this. It's an opportunity for people to be in a space to have honest, open uh, communication, to be able to understand the foundation of some of these issues, but also to see the pro progress, progression. Um, it's from, from history, and of course, I'm biased. I'm an archivist. Um, 
But it's these opportunities starting in history to into the present that we can continue to have these open dialogues with substance. Um, having just been at the Columbia Archive now for two years, um, there is such a plethora of rich resources and really looking forward to time when we can open again to the public fully. We're still accessible online. I'm there I'm still answering questions, but there are so many resources that deal with the intimate story and the rich legacy of the Columbia, of the, the planned community of Columbia. And even though we are, of course, housed in the Columbia Association and we do carry a many of their early records, we really are the archive of the community. So our mission is to not only preserve that story of the institutional development and the structural development of Columbia, but even more so the people that make it the place mm -hmm. that Mr. Rouse wanted people, this garden for people to grow. That people tree that's down at Lake Kitimikundi really is speaking to what Rouse's vision as well as all his supporters because he was the innovator, he was the visionary, but he had a lot of people that believed in it and that kept this vision going. And so I invite you to contribute to the archive. I invite you to visit the archive. I invite you to re reach out, think of research questions, call, email me if there's something that is of interest to you, but please allow us to be of service to help you so we can tell the comprehensive story of Columbia. Because if it's one-sided, we're gonna be in the same place with our historical records. We can't afford to do that. So I really do once again wanna to thank Tonya and um, all of the staff member, Rohini and Nancy and Cynthia for their support. They've been amazing partners in pushing forward these innovative, um, now my first full uh, virtual presentation. Um, and I'm, ha I'm happy that that, that particular, um, that this event has taken place with the library system. So thank you very much. And thank you for all the panelists because you all are amazing. And I really appreciate the fact that you took this evening out to speak about the presence place of progress and struggle within uh, black businesses in the county. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone stay safe and have a great, great evening and a super week coming up. Thank you. Thank you you too yeah. as well. Thank you. You okay. too as well.